this one. Sorry, I got the screen on the computer as well. Um, so once you figure out what it is you want to work on, the next thing you got to do is set out goals. And I'm a huge, huge believer in setting very realistic goals. So what I mean by that is something that is not insane. If you're back squatting 200 pounds and you're like, okay, in the next six weeks, I want to back squat 300 pounds. It's probably never going to happen. And if it is, it's like, it's going to take an insane amount of work and you're not being realistic about it. So you want to be super realistic about what your goals are so that when you, so that you can achieve them and then see yourself checking things off down the road. There's something about setting really big goals that a lot of people love, like set this crazy goal. And sure, long-term, you can set insanely high goals. But if you set a bunch of small goals, you're way more likely to get there and check those things off the list. Um, I use it. The other thing you want to figure out is how much investment you want to make. So if you're looking to make, like to put more volume in, I use like a simple number of 15%. You want to add no more than 15% more volume to your week than you're already doing because you like, that's something you can handle slowly and it's not going to blow you away over the next little while. The goal is adding stuff smallly so that you get bigger. Think of it as like an investment. If you go and like go all in on one investment right now and then like it doesn't work out, you're you know, you're not saving a lot of money. Like if you save $500 today and put it in the bank, sure, that's great. You have $500. You beat the guy that put $100 in, but the guy that puts $100 a week for every week of the year is obviously going to have way more money than the guy that put $500 down three times because that guy's consistent and he's got a manageable number. It's like, okay, it's, it's $100. I can do that. I can manage it. And over time, that really grows. Same thing with time commitment and energy commitment to something like this. If you're looking at, like, say I used, I think the breakdown is if you have, if you do four to five classes a week of CrossFit, you don't want to be adding in more than say 45 minutes a week of extra stuff. So that's not a ton of stuff, but it, the, the beauty of that is it's very easy to hold yourself accountable. So 15 minutes a day, two to three times a week before or after class of something, not a lot to do, or sorry, not like a hugely intimidating amount to do, but it's going to add up so much by the end of the year. You know, if you do three months on, 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 one specific accessory movement or you know say whatever it is you want to work on you do that for three months you do four different cycles in the year you've just spent you know however much time on something and i see the big mistake that uh, so many people make is they add in like an hour and a half of extra stuff for three weeks right after a competition when they're so so fired up and they're so excited about everything and then it dies off after that and you want to you want to set yourself up to avoid those mistakes because that's just human nature to make those mistakes. Instead of that, you want to be like, okay, this is what I can do. I know I can handle this. And I know there's no excuse that I can't do two to three days a week of 15 minutes of accessory stuff. Um, so that's kind of how I look at it from that angle. What do we got? Here's the next point. So the next one, keep stuff super simple. You don't want to overcomplicate things. You don't want to take on way too much at the same time. You want to find, sorry, I'm just going to move my screen around here. Okay, yeah, so the other thing I'm big on, when you're doing this, you want to limit yourself to one, maximum two things at a time to work on. I'm a big fan of just find one thing that you need to work on get better at it. So say, for example, your thing to get better on is pull-ups. Don't like, you don't want to do pull-ups, handstand push-ups, clean and jerks and snatches, and then running all at the same time. Because again, it's just all leading to things that are going to burn out for you. If you're just like, I'm going to get better at pull-ups. Okay. So what are the things you're going to add in for pull-ups? You're going to do a lot of lat work, some bicep work, some gymnastics work. So things like hanging from a bar for amount of time to like get your, your forearms a little bit stronger, doing strict pull-ups, doing things like uh, hollow body holds, hollow body rocks, uh, chin over bar holds. Then you're gonna be doing things like bent over rows, ring rows, curls, like all these kind of things are gonna just help you get better pull-ups. With that key focus on pull-ups, it's gonna trickle into other areas. Even though we're not working on other areas, if I have you doing, you know, if I'm programming for someone, I have them doing all these things, if they're doing bent over rows and curls all the time, like it's going to help other things. It's going to help things like they're clean and deadlift because their core strength is still going to get a little bit better. If they're hanging off the bar, they're going to get better at um, just their grip strength from just constantly hanging off the bar. 
And uh, if they're doing, so that's going to trickle over, not just to like the obvious things like muscle ups and maybe handstand push ups. Like it is going to affect clean and jerks, um, all kinds of other gymnastics, handstand push ups, handstand holds. The mo like getting really, really good at one thing will expand to other areas. Whereas spending a bunch of time on different stuff, just working the actual movements, is probably going to be less effective. And the other thing you got to remember is if you're following a regular class program, you're already on a complete program. So you just want to find something specific to work on and try and improve there. The, uh, the last thing is just kind of finding little ways to make sure you actually stick with what you do. I kind of broke this down into three things. The first one, and this is sort of like a shameless plug for us at the gym, pay for a program. Every single study that's ever been done shows that if you pay for something, you are more invested in it. If you're like, okay, I'm gonna pay someone to program for me for two months, this is what I'm gonna do. One, they're gonna hold you accountable, and two, you're gonna hold yourself accountable because you've put an investment in it. The investment, like the amount you put in, dictates how much you care about it. So the more you care about it, like the more you put in, the more you're gonna care, the less you're gonna skip out on stuff. So you're just gonna set yourself up for success that way. On top of that, if you decide like that's not the way you wanna go, there are other programs that you can just find. Like there's a ton of programs online. Everyone that I've ever programmed for is aware that they can find a program online. They all know that they exist. They need the accountability and they need the investment in it. So that's what you know coaches really offer. And that's why a bunch of people pay for programs that while well, there's still other free programs out there. Yes, it's uniquely fitted to you, but the main thing is you're gonna have to talk to the person and say, I did it or I didn't do it, and this is why I'm getting better, this is why I'm not getting better. Um, the second best way is to get other people to do it with you. Get some kind of buy-in from someone else and have them, you know, be like every Tuesday night, like me and Chris are gonna do like some kind of pull-up work. So we're gonna meet Tuesdays at six, after the 6.30 class and spend 15 minutes on it. I know he's doing it, he knows I'm doing it, we're gonna meet up then and actually get it done. And then the last way, and this is a good way to get started with things, is even though I spent a lot of time talking about like working on weaknesses because it's the best thing, if you're trying to just add a bit of volume and you think the main thing you need to do is just get a little bit more work in, it's actually not the worst thing to start off with something that you kind of like and you know is going to help you stick with it. Because, you know, if you just did a hard workout, like we've all been there, we've done a, a tough CrossFit wad, and you're like, okay, I'm laying on the ground, I'm dying, like I barely got through the stretch that the coach did and now I'm supposed to go do something else. If that something else is something you really don't want to do, it's way harder to get that commitment level up. Like if I'm saying to you, okay, you just did a hard workout, spend 15 minutes, grab a glass of water, you know, have a carb shake, and then I want you to start doing sprint intervals on the assault bike, you are probably going to be like, screw that. That sounds terrible. I'm not going to do it. But if it's something that's a little bit more fun, if you're a big fan of like, if you're, say you used to go to the regular gym and you kind of miss bench pressing and be like, okay. The first thing you do is do a bench program. It's going to be dumbbell bench one day a week, regular bench the other day of the week. It's not going to be a ton of volume. It's not going to be a ton of volume. It's not going to be a ton of intensity, but you know it's going to like make you feel better, make you look better, and get you closer to your results. Then that can definitely help you out that way and get you started on that. So if that's your first 12 week program and you do that 12 week program and it goes well and you get some results, you're going to be way more likely to commit to it and keep going from there. Uh, those are basically like the main points that I have going into it. Uh, I think that was pretty much all the stuff that I had set out ahead of time. But sorry, I keep closing my screen and then reopening it again. Um, but I kind of, since it's a super small group, like let's open it up to questions. Um, if you guys have any questions, if you've done it before, if you haven't done it before, uh, what's worked for you, what hasn't worked for you. All right. What do you think a common mistake is you see with uh, with new CrossFitters that have fitness uh, experience that want to get good really fast? Like, what do you think the best plan of action for them is? And do you have like a general uh, timeline uh, to tell them like, hey, you want to get somewhere, but like, say, I want to get to a competition in X amount of time, or like, what like what kind of time frame would you tell them to realistically look at and what kind of goals should they expect throughout the process uh so you're, so was, you're fit like, yeah. you're a good lifer who's been you know who works out every single day who's who's you know fit and whatnot but wants to take it more competitively but their their background is like they're into functional fitness and bodybuilding 
but not CrossFit? Um, I think one of the things for that specific person that I would want to have them do pretty quickly. So not maybe like give them three to four months to get used to like CrossFit and get into it. And we're like, when you're in the beginning, like every single day is a competition already. Like the first, I remember that. I'm sure you remember that. Like every single day it felt like a competition, but once you're a few months in and you're sort of proficient at everything and I can look at you and be like, okay, you're not going to really hurt yourself yet. Get a competition signed up for, like get yourself signed up for a competition in three months or whatever the time domain is. So you have a clear date to look forward to. So you're like, okay, I'm three months in and I've got a competition three months from now. And you see every day who's beating you at what, and you get that feedback right away. I would say, okay, now you saw that like everyone beat you when we did toaster bar because you don't know how to link them together. That person's going to be way more invested in doing stuff right now than they are with like a hypothetical competition date someday in the future. I'm not a huge, huge fan of people that are like, oh, I want to compete one day when I get good at CrossFit. No one's going to be good enough at CrossFit to start competing. Like no one has ever been like, okay, I'm ready. I'm super confident. Like I'm going to be good at everything. You just got to get in there and see what you think about it. And you got to find out if that's what you like. Some people get in there, like my first CrossFit competition, it went okay. Like some things went well, some things went badly. But immediately when I finished, I was like, I got to do that again. Like I'm like the, the ones I lost, I was like, what do I do to get better at? And the ones that I did better at, I was like, what do I got to do to get more of that feeling again? So I think just get for certain people, especially with the necessary basic skills to do it, I want them signed up for something. So it's very palpable, like when you want to be better by, and it's easier to set goals for it that way. Uh, you know, I think you bring up a great, like, well, you answered it really well. And it, it gets me thinking, because, like, you know, we, we've seen so many people come and go that come and have amazing backgrounds, um, you know, at high levels of, uh, you know, just a fitness experience. But uh, I think just thinking about it now, a lot of times people go in and they start doing all the best programming and try to do everything, but they wait too long to get into an actual competition where they have unrealistic expectations because they're like, well, this is the hardest I've ever trained in my life. I've got the best coach, the best programming. So you just automatically expect to do extremely well. And then when you have unrealistic expectations because you have no experience um, and you've been doing it, say like eight months, nine months, maybe a year, and you do your first competition, it's a, it's a hard shot to the ego because of the reality of like, this is where you're actually at. Right. I think, uh, I think, you know, if I were to talk to people, I think you're, you're right where I would try to get people in as soon as, as soon as possible where they don't have huge expectations yet, but it, it lets them kind of have a realistic, uh, you know, set point of where they're at. Just because, you know, it, it's obviously not the greatest feeling when you think you're better than you are. And then a year later, you finally, you know, test yourself and like, oh my God, I just got my ass handed to me. When that sh that's going to happen your first time anything, at anything when you have zero experience, right? Yeah, and it's always better to go in with low expectations and over deliver than go in with high expectations and under deliver. And yeah, like you said, the longer you wait, the higher expectations are going to be. And again, CrossFit's a sport that you're never going to catch up to it. Like you're never going to, like, you could talk like Steve. I don't know if Steve's actually on the call or not on the call. His screen's on. Like Steve is insanely good at snatching. Like insanely good at snatching. And I think his max snatch is 290. I'm sure if you asked him, like, he'd be like, oh, I'm just so close to 300. So it doesn't matter how good you are. You're always going to think that you're not quite there. So the sooner you can get out in other people, like competing with other people who also are all in the same boat as you, the sooner you're going to kind of like be okay with that. So that being said, you think it's how important do you think it is having a coach for you? Uh. Yeah, I think like I'm a big, a way bigger believer in coaching than programming. I think programming is useful. I think coaching is way more valuable. I think the best program written by the greatest guy ever who just has studied everything and knows everything about weightlifting and all that stuff doesn't matter if they can't connect with you and understand like what you're doing. And like if you're hours a week and you can only do an hour a week, like it's a bad program for you. So your coach has to know you and has to understand what you want and what your goals are and keep you accountable that way. So yeah, I'm a huge believer in, in coaching above anything else and connecting with a person above everything else. Do you guys have any other questions as well? Like we could kind of keep going with this. 
this is fun for me anyways, but uh, anybody else have any questions they want us to address? Does anybody have any weaknesses and they want to improve, but they're not sure which wire, which like where to, what to attack first. If they, if you're curious about like hierarchy in like related to CrossFit or um, where you want to be with your goals. Anybody? Tough crowd, Rob. Yeah. Tough crowd. <laughs> Yeah, okay. So I guess since I'm pretty new, I still got a lot that I need to work on. Um, yeah, and I know you mentioned like pull ups, for example, like I, I so I can do maybe one pull up and that's about it. And I guess for me, the issue is, after you come back down, I can't do like that second portion again, where I'm pulling myself back up after I've come down. Yeah, so pull-ups is a great one to bring up. It's uh, probably the most common thing, and I'm sure Chris has said the same thing, that you hear from women, right? Like it's getting their first pull-up, getting better at pull-ups. Those are the main things that you that you always hear. Um, just genetically, women have less natural upper body strength than guys do, and they have to work harder for the same like gains. Like a guy to get to 10 pull-ups does not have to put the same work in that a woman does especially like if they've come from a regular bodybuilding, like bodybuilding sort of gym versus like a fit um, woman. Like a lot of really fit women come into the gym and you look super fit, you have muscle tone and you're still like, okay, I can do one pull up, right? Whereas most guys come in and if they're like fairly fit, they play sports, like they can do a couple pull ups and they just need to like work technique and work injury prevention and that sort of thing. With that, uh, the big thing is adding in stuff that you're not doing in pull-ups. So I think we do a lot of stuff. If you're, you know, unable to do your first pull-up, uh, you're probably doing a ton of band work and you're probably doing a ton of uh, ring rows, right? With those two movements, because they're going to, because when we program a workout for you, we're trying to get you the same stimulus. And I want, like, if I program you and Chris the same workout, I want you guys to feel the same way. I want you guys to be stopped by the same things. I want you to push through the same things easier. So if I were to say, you know, 20 strict pull-ups for both of you guys to do, it would have a drastically different feeling. Like there would be way more conditioning in it for Chris than there would be for you. So you scale it down to get the same feeling. The problem with that is you're not necessarily going to be building the muscle in the same way. So you want to work on other things outside of it. Uh, on, like there's a bunch of stuff obviously you can do. My personal favorite thing is negatives for pull-ups especially for women, I just found that that has the best result, the best bang for your buck. Uh, it's not like a miracle fix all thing. It's not like you're going to do 10 negative strict negative pull-ups and you're just immediately going to be able to like start doing kipping butterfly pull-ups, but getting, getting those weirder other things that you're not going to see in the day-to-day -day class in are really useful. And then again, getting some, like making sure you're doing it regularly. Cause like I find, I mean, we were talking about one of the biggest issues um, that I noticed with certain people there's a certain personality type that, you know, you do a competition, you're fired up or you do something and you're new and you're excited about it. And you have like this rampage for like two to three weeks where you like do every class, do a class every day. And then you do all this accessory stuff. And one, you realize your life can't work like that. Or two, you get hurt. So either way, you, you know, you run out of energy, you run out of time, you get hurt and you stop training. So you've added so much onto it that long-term you're not, you're not doing the same amount of volume and really like all, like everything is, is like you get better from training and you need to set the rest of your life up to train as much as you can within your goal setting. So you need to sleep a certain amount. You need to eat a certain amount. You need to be like relieved of stress to a certain amount so you can hit that training volume and you have to be realistic about what it is. If you're like, I'm going to train for three hours a day and also not change my life in any way, like that's not gonna happen. So I think I kind of got off on a tangent, but yeah, you just, I would say find stuff outside of what you're doing because you're already doing that. You're already gonna get a bunch of ring rows. You're already gonna get a bunch of banded pull-ups in. So don't try and do more of that, try and do different stuff. And especially on a more literal, like slower, stricter movements is what you wanna be adding in because we're already adding in a lot of intensity with a regular CrossFit class anyways. Chris, you got anything to add on that? You know what? I think one of the things, especially when it comes time to strict training, like uh, like strength training, 
Um, when we're CrossFitters, we feel like in order for us to work hard, we need to feel like our hearts are about to explode, right? So like say I told uh, Rachel to do like an EMOM, one strict pull-up every minute on the minute for 30 minutes. She would probably have a heart attack and be like, bro, that's such a waste of time. I could burn like a thousand calories, roll around, want to die in 10 minutes. And like, I can have muscle fatigue in five minutes if you gave me like some kind of crazy AMRAP, right? But it's, I think it's hard for, I want to say CrossFit specifically, to slow everything down and feel that concentric phase and feel that like they're strong throughout, like feel that connection from their brain to those muscles throughout the full range of motion and feeling it equally, right? So I think, uh, you know, having awareness for that and maybe I guess us coaches letting our members know the importance of that, like that is just as important as hitting an AMRAP of, you know, pull-ups and thrusters or whatever the movements are, right? Um, I know like me recovering from surgery, I learned a lot where there is so much range of motion in my pull-ups and I was always good at pull-ups, even though I'm a big dude, I've never had issues at pull-ups uh, competing. At least I don't think I did, but by me taking the time to and being forced to take the time to scale everything back and get strong throughout my full range of motion, like I didn't have, I had the time to be like, well, I can't really do a whole lot right now. So I'm going to just focus on getting as strong as I can. My goal was to bring my hand, my arms from overhead to have just as much strength, as much strength overhead as I could pulling, rotating into a full muscle, right? And that sounds weird where, you know, we try to teach our class, like we want them to just be able to touch their, go from a hanging position, make their chest touch the bar, right? And that's good enough. But my goal is to have complete range, like strength throughout a way greater range of motion. And it might, it might seem like a paradigm shift for other people, but it's like, well, why, why shouldn't we be trying to do things like that? Because obviously it's gonna make you fitter, but it's going to decrease the chance of injury and it's going to help you for long-term, uh, long-term training uh, and goals, uh, you know, get long-term. Right. And, but it's, it's just taking the time to slow everything down. And it turned out when I was doing and focusing on it, I was able, like I did some tests with the guys on my team, you know, like Brandon who could do 20 plus muscle ups and I made him do uh, banded strict muscle ups. Same with Steve, same with Sasha, same with Laura, and I was able, and I'm recovering from a shoulder surgery, and I was able to do more than they were just because I took the time to slow everything down, right? And it's, and it's just remembering for me personally to keep that in mind that faster and more weight is not necessarily better. It's keeping the quality of the movement down properly and having intention with every single movement and like every single angle when, when you're trying to, uh, trying to move properly. Yeah. And then also just, you know, you look at bigger picture and what your goals are. And then again, what your commitment level is. If you've got say, you know, 45 minutes, four days a week, and you're just starting out like, yeah, your best bang for your buck time-wise is going to be burpees and lightweight thrusters and just stuff that like really does like get you super gassed. Because if you're just like on a certain amount of time, you're newer at this, you're trying to maybe lose weight, get down to like, you know, what you used to look like before in college or something like that. Like CrossFit's really, really good for that. But yeah, once you get more into it, you're like, okay, I want to get better at this and I want to do this for a long time. You do have to think about, okay, well now I want to invest more time and I'm already spending enough time. Like, like Chris said, we're already doing the burpees and the thrusters and the, the killing ourselves, right? We're good at that. Like that's what we're really good at. And what we're not good at is like humbling and slowing down and being like, okay, like you said, it's really tough after all that time to say, how can I like, you know, tar start doing really slow, strict muscle ups because I think I'm good at muscle ups already. And maybe you had that because you got injured, you had that opportunity to be like, well, I, you know, I'm injured, so I, I should be bad. So I'm going to try and I'm going to be very humble with it. And it allows you to try new things and try from a different perspective. Whereas, you know, for me a long time, it took, it took me a long time to be like, okay, you know, what I can do like a lot of toes to bar because I'm really good at kipping. But my strict toes to bar were terrible because I had no core strength. I was just knew how to swing really efficiently on a bar. And once you're like, accept that, then you're like, okay, now I'm going to put the time and effort in to actually get that control. Right. So for me, that was a big one and build that ab strength up so I could do those movements and do it that I wasn't going to hurt myself from doing it every, you know, three days a week for six years. Yeah. I, I know for me personally, I think the take home message is, 
you know, like you said, you do one thing and you get, again, especially if you just start across it, you see huge, huge improvements for a long time, really, really quickly. Right. So it's natural to think, well, just do more of what I'm already doing and I'm going to continue to see pro progress. And, um, it's, I think the balance, and I guess that's where coaching comes into play. Um, someone, you know, who's unbiased and who's able to look at you and say, you've done really well up until now, but you can't continue to do the same thing and expect, you know, new things to, to, to happen to you. You're going to have to actually, you know, slow things down or learn how to balance out programming and stuff. And I think that's where a lot of people have a hard time, you know, getting to that next level where they're either, they get frustrated or they get injured or they stay the same. You know what I mean? Um, and I think it's, it's having that awareness and having people there like outside of you, out of you know, your own head uh, to let you know when it's okay to start doing different things and not worrying about, you know, intensity, intensity and volume and volume. Right? Yeah. And like doing things like you can look at it as like changing it, but in a way you're still doing the same thing because when you first started CrossFit, it was new, it was challenging and it was humbling. And if you get someone that's been doing CrossFit for four years to do Helen, like, you know, kettlebell swings, pull-ups and running, like it, it isn't that anymore. It's not new. It's not challenging. It's not humbling. Like you're, you're good at it. It's what you're used to doing. So doing something that's new and chat, like you're, you're still getting that same, like stimulus is more of like a mental stimulus than a physical stimulus, but you're still taking on this new thing. And when you do something new, you're going to get more return on that investment because it's new and different. The same thing is going to get you the same results. And if your results are, the other super simple way to look at it is like crossfitters in the first year, it's awesome. Like you PR all the time. Like I, Chris will tell you the same thing. It's like, you just all the time, you're crushing your goals, crushing your goals. Like if it's working and you find like month over month, you're absolutely getting better at every single thing. Like don't change anything. It's working for you. You're killing it. Like this is not when you need to make changes when you're like, okay, I've been at the exact same weight on my clean and jerk for two years now and I clean and jerk three days a week, like that's when you have to be like, okay, something's not working and I need to figure out why because I care enough to make it better. Yeah. I'll attest to the programming for you guys <laughs> because, um, so I don't know, maybe two years ago, Steve put together a pull-up program. Um, and so, I that was kind of one of my goals I just wanted to do a pull-up because my upper body strength is hor horrific <laughs> but um so I followed his program to a T it was only eight weeks and I literally did it two or three times a week for like maybe 15 minutes at a time and probably I was only actually doing pull-ups I would say maybe once a week all the other time was like um sled pulls uh ring rows like stuff that I was like, I'm just going to trust the process. I'm not going to, you know, wrap my head around the fact that I'm not actually doing pull-ups. So how is my pull-up going to get better? And it worked. Um, you know, I, I'm definitely not efficient or amazing at them, but, um, but it was the first time where I was like an actual program given to me by a coach who, who knows what they're doing instead of me just kind of randomly, you know, coming up with stuff that, you know, I see here or there that we do in class or whatever uh, made a huge difference. And then I did the same thing with toes to bar. Um, I did a, a, Brandon gave me a program for that. And then I was able to start stringing them together. I'm kind of back. I've taken a bunch of steps back now because I haven't been able to do them in a while since I hurt my back. But at least I know that I have that program there and that it works. So if just as a, like, a, you know, everyday Joe Blow kind of attendee at the gym, I can like for sure to me and I think to most people, it is the coaching and the programming that makes a huge, huge difference. You know what though? Like the, I think the, the amazing thing, how, again, we're talking about exercise and building muscles and being fit and all that stuff, but these principles are the exact same principles as, as being successful in life. Like, you know what I mean? Like you can only go so far by yourself. You know, that's why we go to school. That's why we have teachers. That's why we have mentors. That's why we have consultants, right? Like it's, it's really a no brainer. Like, how am I going to become a millionaire if I've never been a millionaire? And if I don't know any millionaires, right? I need to be around those people. I need to hear them, talk to them, find out their exact experiences because like Dorana, those programs that were made is because we made those mistakes ourselves. Right. And we know exactly what we don't want to see you guys go through. 
right? We want to save time and years off your training because we've already made all the mistakes and that's, you know, just do this and you're going to, you know, you don't have to, you know, trial and error and find out and think about it and then reassess and reevaluate, right? Um, but again, yeah, and the same principles as successful, right? And sometimes the coach for me right. even is just, um, it's like a safety net for me. So just because I'm, I'm answering more directly to Rachel, I don't know you, Rachel, but um, <laughs> because I, I was like, a lot of it is fear-based too, right? So I couldn't do a handstand. I could never mind the handstand push-up. I, I couldn't do a handstand. So I did like, I think I did six personal training sessions just to, and I didn't even get the handstand during my PT sessions. I ended up getting it after, but it was the fact that though that coaching for me gave me the confidence to try and do the practice without a coach beside me all the time. I wouldn't, cause initially I didn't even try it without a coach beside me. Um, but then just having those few sessions gave me the confidence to be like, okay, I can at least try it. I know I'm not going to kill myself, or at least I know how to not kill myself. Um, and then I could go from there and then, it, and then I did get it, but I wouldn't have done that on my own, no matter how much I practiced by myself. And I guess, I, I think it's important to, you know, that, that you shared that was like, you know, you didn't get it during those six sessions, but it, it got you to believe in yourself. And, and it's not necessarily looking at a PR as in like, oh, I didn't get a, P, uh, a, a handstand push up in six sessions with, and I paid for PT, so it doesn't work. It's like, no, it got, it built you the confidence. So the fact that you, it built you the confidence to work towards six hours of going upside down, right? Like that alone yeah. is a huge PR, probably all the time put together before that, you never put six hours of trying to go upside down. So right there, that's a PR when you look at, you know, um, time. And then we obviously know all the benefits of that. Like you, you start getting more comfortable with what you're doing. You build that confidence, you build more awareness, right? And it's finding the other PRs that, you know, we don't necessarily look at because we just don't, if we don't see the final result, well, I didn't like say, like we wanted to work on a clean. Well, I didn't, uh, I didn't increase my, my one max clean in an eight week program, but I might be able to hit 95% of my one rep max um, for reps after the, 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 the eight or 12 week program. So that is a volume PR or I'm able to, my movement quality is way better than before. And it's, and you have to look at it. It's like that whole lifestyle fitness thing. It, it's, it's the translation of all like the, how much it's going to help you down the road, right? It's going to allow you to not get injured. It's going to allow that movement quality to be more stuck in your brain. So this way, you know that when you do your crossword workouts, you can move smoother, which means you get more reps. And if you get more reps and you get more rounds, in, which means you burn more calories and you stimulate more muscle and you gain more muscle and then you start getting fitter regardless, right? So it's, it's managing those, um, those PRs where it's not necessarily the, the, the number amount or the actual completion. There's so many other ways to look at PRs. And, you know, when Rob brought up that, you know, when you're a f first year CrossFitter, every day is a PR day. Like life is great. But when you're on year 12, like me, you have to find so many layers and levels of PRs. Cause if I just looked at numbers, like if I don't, if, if I just looked at like my one rep max PRs for my lift, I would have quit years ago because I don't, I don't PR on my, on my weightlifting movements. For me, it's all about my movement quality and bringing down my, you know, RPE. Um, so this way, yeah, you know what, I'm not lifting heavier, but I'm able to work at a higher capacity or a higher intensity. And that alone is just as important, especially for, for fitness, uh, compared to just looking at that one rep max number, right? And I, I think it's important to remember that and think about that. Yeah, and nowadays too, like especially, you know, when you get into the competitions, so I think people look, I mean, I'll, I'll bring up like, you look at movements like uh, either, you know, like a one rep max clean jerk or a snatch, maybe a back squat or things like max unbroken muscle ups, pull ups, handstand push ups, something like that. We are sort of like in this world where you always see like what everyone's best is all the time. So when you post on Instagram, you post like, oh, I just finished an eight week cycle and I hit a new clean jerk PR and it was under perfect conditions. And then you're like, okay, well, that's what everyone else is clean and jerking now because I saw that guy do it. And I, like, I went in and I weight lifted today and I, got, I was like 20 pounds less than that. So you get like super caught up with like not being good enough in that capacity, which is like, don't get me wrong. There is a little, there is some value in feeling like you need to work harder to catch up to other people. Like it's not non-existent, but it has to be very realistic. Like you have to look at it and be like, okay, well, yeah, that guy's like definitely better than me at this, but like, I know like we'll bring up like Chris's like idol and best friend, Nick, your anchor. 
is like a really <laughs> good lifter. And, you know, he can lift more weight than Chris can. But Chris beat him on a 5K. So it kind of balances out. Forget forget that. Forget yeah. that. Chris won't ever let you forget that he beat this. He was a games athlete, you know, really, really solid guy. This, this is being the recorded. Happiest. They're going to believe this. Stop. This is the happiest Chris ever was when he was bragging about beating Nick Ranker in a 5K at the 2018 I've never Granite Games. I've been a games athlete in my life before. So, um, yeah, you have to, you have to be reasonable with it. And the other thing is I've said on one of the other ones we were talking about is if you're looking at your, we got to go back to overall, like what your goals are. And if your goals are being really good at CrossFit and you maintain the same lifting numbers, for example, but get better at everything else, like you are better at CrossFit, right? Like that, that makes, that's clearly an important thing to look at. And you also want to make sure when you're doing, when you start working on stuff, like it doesn't become obsessive. If you're trying to be, if you're like a, an okay runner, you're like, I want to get better at running. Like, obviously that's a good thing. But if you look and you spend a crazy amount of time on running and get so obsessed with running that that starts deteriorating from everything else. And you're like, that's why you need a coach to be like, Hey, you know, like, it's great that your running is better, but like every time a heavy barbell comes up, like you get smoked. So you maybe need to go back to that and just kind of like always be big picture. Like, am I working towards what I actually want or am I fixated on this small little thing, like a five pound PR and an arbitrary number, you know, like for me, like when I was back squatting earlier, like 315 was this huge number in my head and I was at like 305 or something like that. And it was like, I was so caught up on 315 because that just happened yeah. to be three plates on a bar. Like that just, just by random luck, that's how it works out to have 315. And I felt so inadequate because I couldn't do 315. But realistically, it's like, that's not a huge difference maker. And you're just going back to this random number of the weight that a bar happens to be and the main weights that they happen to use to lead up to 315 pounds. It could have been, you know, 325 or it could have been 285, but that's happened to be where you get obsessed. And if you get too narrow minded and too focused in on that, you're going to lose all these other things obsessing over one thing that may end up getting there anyways, as long as you just stick to the path. Coming up on an hour. Does anybody have any other questions, anything like that? Chris, any more thoughts? No, I think, uh, I think you, you know, addressed everything uh, really well. I think you definitely got people thinking uh, on the right, uh, right path of, you know, like, you know, not necessarily doing the same thing all the time for a long period of time is, is the way to go. You know, there's a time and a place for that. Um, you know, having someone tell you that it's not always the number amount that like you just said, like it's, there's so many more, there's so much more to look into, you know, bettering yourself in fitness. It's not always the number. Um, and it's understanding that you're going to get there eventually. It's just, it's just, it's a process and there's so many little things that people don't realize. So we always look at, you know, the, the end, the end result. And we obviously want to use that as our hierarchy, but know that it's a process and there's so many little wins that we can have along the way. And just being reminded that that's how we should look at it. Um, because again, this is a whole lifestyle. If we want to be doing this for until the rest, until we die, we have to look at it as there's always little wins and there's a lot, a lot more layers than people realize. And again, that, that comes with experience. Um, because if you're always looking at, well, I didn't PR for two weeks or a month or six months, um, you're not going to last very long because there's way more involved and way more things that people can, can start thinking if they, you know, if they're aware of it or if they, you know, talk to people, have someone kind of, consult them and coach them and get them to understand, um, you know, what the proper mindset is, is because again, this mindset is the exact same thing as, you know, working in your career. You know what I mean? When you go to school the first three, four years, you went from learning nothing to being an expert. And then how much more are you going to learn from year five to year 10? Is it going to be exponential like the first four years? No, absolutely. Absolutely not. So we have to look at what keeps us motivated to keep on doing or keep on doing our job for years and years to come. Right. It's, there's so many more things along the way that, that might seem small, but they're, they're, they're significant regardless. Yeah, absolutely. All right, guys. Well, I think we're coming up on an hour, so we'll probably wrap this one up here. Awesome. Thanks but, a lot, Rob. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk, man. Yeah. Thanks for uh, coming out, everybody. Have a uh, good afternoon. I'm doing the dumbbell class at 3.30 today. You guys want a good workout? Looks like a fun one. If not, see you guys later on.
Keep fit. Have fun. Have fun. <laughs> See you later. Hey, Rob. Yeah. Can you post that article that you were talking about earlier? Uh, yeah, it's on, if you want to see it, it's on um, Christini Athletics blog. Okay. And just put in accessory. It's okay. like accessory programming or how to start accessory program, something along those lines. And uh, yeah, you can find it there. Okay, thanks. Thank you. See ya.